Hello and welcome to another episode of Massey Ferguson Hey Talk. My name is Matt LaCroy. I'm the Director of Marketing for Massey Ferguson and Heston by Massey Ferguson. And I'm Jessica Williamson, Livestock and Forage Specialist with Agco. We're here to help you get the best hay possible. In this season on Hay Talk, we're diving even deeper, looking into how you can maximize your output, get the most from your equipment, and more. On today's episode, we're getting into some machine recommendations and settings, adjustments you can make in the field, uh, things that might seem pretty straightforward if you look at it on the, at the onset, or you might think it's a non-issue, but when you really get into uh, these settings, it could make or break your season. Uh, it could make or break your hay crop. Uh, it's a pretty big highlight on why we, you know following manufacturer's recommendations is very important uh, when it comes to running your equipment, and there's a fair bit to cover. So Today, we're going to be covering mowers and tedders. And then on the following episode, we're going to be covering uh, balers and rakes because there's a lot to cover here to make sure you get the best out of your crop. So uh, hang with us, pass the break, and we'll dive right into the recommendations for mowers and tedders. All right, and welcome back from the break. And we're going to start off on today's manufacturer's recommendations. We're going to start talking about mowers first, and then we'll hit tedders. We'll go into the full process of the, the haymaking process. So in tomorrow's episode, obviously, we'll get into rakes, and then we'll do balers last. So with disc mowers, we have a full lineup uh, from Massey Ferguson and Heston by Massey Ferguson. Whether you're looking for a three-point mounted disc mower, uh, we have about five or six different sizes for you. And we also have optional conditioners. You can get a roller conditioner or a tying conditioner on our disc mowers. That is an industry exclusive. So it's really cool for people in some areas when they want to get some good conditioning out of their disc mower. Keep in mind, it does add some weight to the actual machine. So make sure the ballast weight of your tractor is big enough. So safety is first there. And then you can jump into our mower conditioners. Our mower conditioners go from 9 feet all the way up to 16 feet. And you can get those with without conditioners as well. The largest being our flagship, the 1316S, which has hydraulic tensioning on the conditioning rolls. So you can make sure you get that proper crimp every time. And uh, we'll start talking about the, the machine settings first. So Jessica, when you're doing mowing, for instance, mm -hmm. you've done some tests and we'll talk about some field tests and trials you've done in, in a minute. But when you're getting in a mower, what's the, the first thing you need to think about? Do you need to think about uh, the pitch on your mower, you need to worry about RPM settings. What do you think we need to look at first? Sure. So I think first and foremost, it's important to make sure that your knives are sharp, right? That's something that a lot of people uh, will try to push just a little bit too far. Um, and if you really think about it, by having sharp knives, that's going to help you to ensure that you're getting that optimal cut quality. And, um, you know, if we are leaving hay in the field, that's dry matter, that's dollars that we're leaving standing out there in the field. And so we're not talking about, you know, uh, mowing lower to get more, more crop. We're talking about just mowing the crop there that's available at your particular mowing height. So at the very beginning of the season, I think that we covered this before, but it's really important just to make sure that you're insured uh, or just to make sure that, you know, your knives are sharp so that you're going to get the best cut quality possible. And uh, following that, this past year, um, we did a, a, a project where we looked at ground speed and cut quality. We also looked at RPM and cut quality. And really what we found was as long as you have that RPM set at the manufacturer's recommendations, the ground speed really didn't have an effect on how much forage was left in that field. So we had the mower set at about three inches for uh, uh, residue height. 
And we ran it at uh, three and a half, six and nine mile an hour across the field. And we really saw the same cut quality or the same amount of residue left in that field at all those different ground speeds. So that's good news for us. If we're running in a really smooth, nice flat field and we want to pick up the speed a little bit, uh, as long as we have sharp knives and we're running at that proper RPM speed, um, we really should get the same cut quality. Where we saw a huge difference was various RPM speeds. So we ran it at 100 RPMs less than manufacturer recommendations at manufacturer recommendations for this particular mower, and then 100 RPMs over. And what we saw was at 100 RPMs less we saw almost a thousand, or I'm sorry, we saw almost a full ton of dry matter left in the field above where that stubble height should have been. So in other words, we saw horrible cut quality. Those blades are running so fast in there, it's pushing the crop over. It's not able to cut that crop and to get optimal dry matter yield. And we saw about two thirds of a ton left in the field whenever we had our RPMs at 100 less than what the overall manufacturer recommendations are. So moral of the story with that project that we ran this past summer was RPM speed is really a uh, key. So don't feel like uh, by bumping up that RPM speed, you're going to get a better cut quality because indeed uh, it completely leaves uh, way too much crop left in that field. That is, you bring up so many good points there. I'm going to start with where you started with knives. It's mm -hmm. super important that you keep uh, sharp knives on your machines, uh, whether it's a disc mower or mower conditioner, or even a self propelled wind roar. Um, keep in mind, most knives, you can flip them so they're reversible. So you can just flip them over and have a new sharp leading edge. Uh, another point is I suggest always changing both sides of the disc. So your disc has two knives, change both of them. And when you do change them, so that you keep your balance in your machine. So that's uh, super important there. Also, um, I like what you're talking about with the RPM speeds. If you start running over RPMs, of course, you run risk of uh, damaging the machine because it wasn't rated for that. And then when we get into uh, tethers and rotary rakes and even round balers and stuff, square balers, that comes in very uh, to play very importantly as well. Just, just as much as it does with disc mowers. And also, I know this subject is about manufacturer's recommendations, but you also touched on stubble height and everything. So if you can give us just two minutes, your thoughts on stubble height and dry down. Yeah, absolutely. So um, stubble height, I guess the definition of that would be how high are we mowing above the soil surface? So I always call it stubble height, or I guess another word would be uh, crop residue. Um, but essentially that's, uh, uh, how high do we have that mower set above the soil surface and each crop species is really going to have a different recommended, uh, stubble height. So, uh, an alfalfa or a clover, we can mow that a little bit lower compared to a grass because of the growing point on that crop. So we can get an alfalfa at two and a half inch stubble height and not cause any damage to the regrowth. Um, of that crop. However, because the grass has a higher growing point um, a little bit further up on that, that crop, we actually need to increase the mowing height or the residue height, the stubble height a little bit compared to alfalfa. So it's really important that we're cognizant of what crop we're going into so that we can match that stubble height to make sure that we're encouraging the regrowth of that perennial crop. Now, if we're in something like a uh, warm season annual where we don't intend to have any sort of regrowth, um, we can, of course, uh, get as much of that crop as possible. Now, another thing that's important to think about whenever we're talking about balancing forage quality and stubble height, the most nutritious portion of that crop is going to be the upper one third of that plant, regardless of what forage species. So if overall quality is what you're going for, the higher that stubble height, the better. Um, but if yield is what you're going for, of course, there's a linear uh, relationship with however low you go on that stem, 
the greater the overall yield you're going to have. But like I started to say a few seconds ago, if you're doing something like a warm season annual where you don't intend to have any sort of regrowth like a perennial crop, um, you can go ahead and harvest that crop pretty low because we don't really have to worry about the growing points on it um, because we're either going to uh, burn it down and plant something into it or till it under and plant something into it, whatever the case may be. Yeah, good point. And then if you start cutting too low, of course, you run the risk, as we've talked about in our other episodes, of introducing ash content into your uh, windrow and then lowering the, the value of it. And when you talk about cutting lower because you want more volume, I've and raise my hand. I've been guilty of that a time or two. Oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Especially when uh, the rains aren't coming, you've got to capture everything you can. That's one thing you do look at. So now we've cut the hay. Uh, let's look over at tetters. So tetters, a lot they're overlooked as an important part of the process, in my opinion, a uh, lot of the times, and sometimes rakes are as well. And we'll talk about that. But uh, I think the tetting process, if you're using a tetter, obviously, it's not conducive to all crop types in all areas. But if you are using a tether to uh, speed up the dry down process, um, what do you think about uh, ground speed? And I don't know if you've done any studies on this or not yet, but ground speed and or RPM speed on your tether. Yep. So uh, interestingly, well, first of all, let me back up a little bit. Um, It's important to think about the overall purpose of a tether. And just like you said, it's to speed up the dry down process. So uh, it's also important to think about um, the timing at which we are tedding. So this isn't necessarily uh, uh, machine settings, but it's more of an agronomic perspective. We need to make sure that we're not tedding that crop too far into the drying process, because as we know, uh, you know, every time we go across that field with a piece of machinery, our forage quality is going to be reduced. So we need to make sure that we're not tedding that crop uh, too dry, because at that point, it's probably time to rake it. So the whole point in tedding is to increase that dry down process or speed up that dry down process and to get as much uh, ground cover and we'll call it swath spread as possible. So we really want to avoid those big clumps and lumps of crop. We want to go through and get the best overall uniformity and ground cover possible. And so this past year, we actually did um, uh, another project looking at some of the uh, ground speed recommendations and PTO RPM speed recommendations with tethers as well. And we wanted to look at um, overall swath spread and ground cover. And what we saw was we actually had a much greater swath height So after that swath was spread out, after that um, initial windrow that we mowed was spread out, we saw a greater height in the crop, which in turn would allow more air to flow through and it would increase the overall dry down process. Whenever we were going four and a half mile an hour, we were going four and a half to five mile an hour across the field versus 10 mile an hour. And we also saw um, overall better uniformity in that spread of that swath and in that ground cover whenever we were going that four and a half mile an hour versus the 10 mile an hour. We really didn't see a huge difference whenever we were looking at RPM speeds, which is kind of contrary to what we saw for our mowing. What we saw was most important with our tedding is kind of going at a slower speed, which I personally think is very interesting because a lot of times We'll see, you know, folks hop on the tether and they're just flying across the field and we'll see clumps of grass. And but with every clump of grass that you see, that's the inability for that crop to get dried down at the same rate as the crop that's next to it. That's in a nice flat swath. And so it's important to look behind you as we're going through the field, make sure that we're getting a nice, flat, uniform spread with our tether. Um, and we're avoiding those clumps. Very, very, super good point. Because I, 
I do see that. And again, I've been guilty of that a time or two, uh, driving across the field way too fast. Not only you're damaging your regrowth on, on your field, but also you're damaging your equipment. Uh, it's not made to be run at uh, 15 miles an hour usually. Yeah. So <laughs> a good consistent speed. And, you know, one of the cool things about some bar tatters that we have a, a the ability, we have a, a lever in the back of it so it can change your swath direction. So when you're cut, you know, uh, doing your tedding down beside a, a fence line, you don't want to throw some of your crop across the fence or into the fence, then you mm-hmm. can't collect it back easily with a rake or something. And you can move that over. So the majority of the crop is all shot out to one side. So that's a, a really good uh, thing there as well. Any other settings uh, you want to talk about, such as, you know, uh, angles. So that's another thing. You can change the angle on most tedders to either lay it out flat or shoot it more up in the air. I mean, when you shoot it up in the air, in my opinion, what I've seen is when it's windy, um, Mm -hmm. it's going to make it blow all over the place and you have your big clumps flying over here and that kind of thing. Any last thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, I think that, like you said, it's probably going to depend a lot on the conditions at which you're tedding in. Um, But it's just really important to make sure that you're getting as even of a distribution as possible, regardless of your crop type, regardless of your angle at which you're tedding. Um, You know, we talked a little bit about it in a few episodes uh, previously, but if we aren't getting even dry down of our crop, we're going to get spots in our hay, you know, moldy spots. It's really, really important, regardless of, of the type of hay that we're making, that we're getting a uniform dry down. And the whole point in the tether is to increase the or to reduce the overall time of dry down. So we need to make sure that we're giving it the best chance possible by ensuring that we're getting a nice uniform spread. You know, ideally we would want a hundred percent ground cover after we go through with a tether. You know, we want those initial swaths that are made by the mower to be completely spread out and the ground to be completely covered um, so that the sun has the optimal opportunity to dry that crop. Yeah. Perfect. And uh, here at Massey Ferguson, we have, Eight tether models, they range from eight feet all the way up to over 41 feet. Uh, We have some standard models that uh, you're used to seeing for for tethers, standard duty. But we also have a new X-series that we have out now. And when you get into those heavy crops, the X-series really comes in handy because it has a J-hook tine on it. And it can grab much heavier crops and move it uh, from point A to point B in a much more efficient manner. Uh, When you see these tethers, you'll see that they're very robust. They have a really really heavy drive line to be able to handle those really heavy wet forages that you're going to see in, in of course, the Northeast and uh, the Atlantic States. And of course, when you're doing some, uh, you know, winter forages and uh, Florida and so forth, you can see that really come into play there. Well, Jessica, thank you for joining me on this episode. It's Thanks been very, for having me. Very good. And uh, can't wait to join you on the next episode. The next episode for all of you that are listening, we're going to be covering rakes and then we're going to cover balers we're going to touch quickly on uh, square balers and round balers on that episode as well so please join us for the next episode of massey ferguson hay talk 